Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us this morning. Uh, we're still continuing on in our, our study on Acts. Last week, um, we watched Paul face this crowd, and he was defending his faith. Ultimately, he was defending Jesus Christ. Um, but at the end of this trial, we're kind of reminded where, where to find strength to speak before an unfriendly or an unbelieving audience. And, and that's the thing. As Paul does this, we, we know they don't want to hear what he has to say. They, we know they're upset with him, and yet he continues to tell them the truth of Christ. It's one thing to know what to say about Jesus and how to say it, but there's also this challenge of finding the strength and the encouragement to proclaim it. I mean, you, we look at Paul's journey and we see that he keeps getting beat down. We see that he keeps getting uh, chased out of town and people are coming at him. Here they've beaten him. Here they're, they're, they're plotting to kill him is basically where we're coming to. And so he's got this, this challenge of, of being strengthened and finding encouragement. And that's what we're going to find today is that God provides comfort for his witnesses. If you are a witness of Christ, say amen. amen. Okay, so we have some here. That's good. I was hoping we had a, a church full. Um, how many of you need comfort periodically from Christ, from our God? I mean, it's hard to go into the world to proclaim his good news. We watch what Paul's up against. We don't face near the persecution that Paul has encountered by this point. But what we see today in this passage is, is the same Jesus who stood for Paul at the cross now stands beside Paul in his trials. Like I said, we need this encouragement too. We need to know that Christ is beside us. Jesus stood for us and now he stands with us as well. Every week before we leave out of here, what do we say at the end of the Great Commission? He is with us till the end, right? He goes with us every week. He's beside us all the time. We need to remember that. This, this Jesus is with, who is with Paul when he testifies before these authorities is the same Jesus who stands with us when we speak the gospel before any audience, audience including those who don't want to hear it or those that don't believe or those that are hostile about it. Anytime we go and present the gospel, he is with us. We've got to remember that. We've got to get that in our head so that we understand when we go, it's not by ourselves. It is with him. And that's where we left Paul, right? He, he's, he's defending himself, he's defending Christ, and he comes to the point where he starts to mention his work with the Gentiles, and that sets the crowd off. This Jewish group starts to riot again. They don't want to hear about what he's doing with the Gentiles. They don't want to hear about what God's doing among the Gentiles. This, this unwilling audience turns, turns tight and they want to kill Paul. Their words and their actions, they express this outrage. Paul, Paul never even gets a chance to address one of the accusations. The, the accusation that he had defiled the temple, they didn't even care to hear his defense. And the reality is because that wasn't the real issue. The real issue wasn't whether or not he defiled the temple. It was whether Judaism was prepared to tolerate Christianity. It's whether they were going to accept the truth of Christ. And it seems at this point they are not. They don't even care. They want Paul gone. They want him dead. Thankfully, we see Paul rescued from this mob. We, 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 we then see how Paul continues to respond to even more trials in Jerusalem in, in the remainder of chapter 22. We're not going to spend any time in chapter 22 today, so go back and read it this week. Study it for yourself. We're going to jump into chapter 23. We're going to look at two short passages. So again, don't just think we're done with 23. Go back and read all of this for yourself. Look into it. Spend some time with it. But we've got this flow of Paul's story. Paul is Paul is on trial, and in response to this, his, his, his gesture of love to Jerusalem church, remember, he brings this offering. He's there to, to show them the, the unity of the, the body, even though they're not all Jewish at this point, and, and, and they reject him. Uh, it's very similar to what Jesus uh, experienced, right? He was rejected by those as well. And so Paul's in good company. All the while, this, this Lysias, he, he's, he's one of the characters in this, this narrative. He's trying to figure out what all this commotion is about. What has Paul done so bad that they want to kill him? And so he's got some questions. He, he kind of gets a sense that something's not right here. And so he, he actually is going to be the one that kind of steps in. Once Paul reveals his Roman citizenship, he, he rebukes the Jewish high priest uh, who had ordered Paul to be physically assaulted. Finally, Paul comes to a point where he starts to, to, to talk about the resurrection and it divides the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He goes on and he, he encourages Christians to submit to the governing authorities as God's ministers of justice, but he also expects the government to exercise its duties rightly. Paul, Paul challenges those in power to wield their authority honorably. 
So this suggests that there's this difference between humbly suffering for Christ and being a victim of injustice. See, we live in a land of laws, and and if the laws protect us, then we're to appeal to them. If the laws prevent us from following our Savior, it's better to obey God than man. As Paul goes on, he rebukes the high priest. Uh, One thing is for certain, Paul is in need of the Lord's grace. As he's walking through this, he's, he's, trying, to, he's trying to represent Christ well. I, I think if you, if you read closely, I think he gets a little ashamed of what he does when he speaks against the high priest. He doesn't know it's the high priest. And, and so he, he's just kind of in this at the moment. And he, he had been beaten by the Jewish mob. The, the, the Romans had almost flogged him. He's hearing, uh, he, he, during this hearing, he's actually punched by one of the religious leaders. I mean, this is bad. Paul's got to be at the end of his rope. Paul's got, I mean, he knew he was going into this in Jerusalem. He knew he was going to suffer, but I don't know if he really understood this is what it was going to be. Despite these challenges, however, he understands, he comes to realize he's not alone while he's doing it. He's never been alone through any of this process. Paul goes on to point out the, that the real issue behind this trial, it was a theological dispute. His belief in Jesus' resurrection, it separated him from the rest of the Jews. And and throughout his defense speech, he constantly goes back to the resurrection. This is why they're getting upset. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to believe it. They don't want to acknowledge that it's true. And so he keeps going back to it. And at the end of this, this trial, we see Jesus appear to Paul. And he commends Paul for testifying about him in Jerusalem. The reality is Paul was just stating the facts. Paul was just telling the truth of Christ. His belief in the risen Christ made him intolerable to many of the Jews. They did not get this. They did not want to. With that said, Paul probably anticipated the division that would follow when he made these statements. So amid these events, we're going to pick up in verse uh, verse 10 of chapter 23 and read verses 10 and 11. Here's what it says. When the disputes became violent, the commander feared that Paul might be torn apart by them and ordered the troops to go down, take him away from them, and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, have courage, for as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so it is necessary for you to testify in Rome. So here they're to a point where where the commander's nervous they're going to actually tear him apart physically. He says, let's get this guy to safety. Let's hold on because he, he knows something's not right here. He can't figure out. He's not for sure. But this, the, the effect of this theological controversy was a sharp division. I mean, in, in essence, the, the Pharisees actually defend Paul in this case. As the apostles' story unfolds, there's going to be others that make that conclusion that, that Paul's innocent. He's done nothing to deserve death. He's done nothing to deserve imprisonment. But here, the, the shouting that, that was happening, it turns to violence. And Lysias, this commander, once again, he he had had to intervene. He rescues Paul and brings him back into the barracks. He still still wasn't clear on what was going on. He still wasn't sure why Paul was charged with everything. He sure wasn't, wasn't, wasn't fully understanding where Paul stood, but he knows I've got to get him safe. He's heard Paul speak of this resurrection. And and that's the thing. The, The resurrection remains central to the Christian faith. Paul keeps going back to it for that purpose. They need to hear the truth. They need to grasp the truth that Jesus died and rose again. They need to come to terms with that. I mean, Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. It all hinges on that. If this isn't true, then what Paul's doing is just crazy. He knows it. He believes that it is true. We believe the same thing. We are to keep heralding the good news of the empty tomb. And when we do, we should expect different responses. We've seen Paul receive all sorts of responses when he speaks of the resurrection. Once Paul's in the barracks, though, he's he's nursing his wounds. He's, He's pondering what just happened. And out of nowhere, Jesus appears to him. Can you imagine? I mean, he's got to be at the lowest point right now. He's come home to love this church, to share with them the unity that they have among all these churches, and and they hate him. They want him dead, and they try to kill him. And and, and here he is, and, and Jesus shows up. He appears to this very discouraged disciple. He he had appeared to him in Corinth previously, but here he shows up in Jerusalem to comfort and to energize Paul for another journey. 
I mean, Paul's got to be thinking, we've got to be about done. How much more can I, t- I mean, I don't know where his mind is, but had it been me, I know I would have been saying, God, we, we, we got to stop. You got to send somebody else. But Paul's reminded from the encouragement of Christ that Christ is always with him. Christ is always with us. We can only speculate again what's happening in his mind before Jesus arrives, before Jesus confronts him. But surely this has to be a low point for Paul. Like I said, he's faced this stuff before, but here he is back in Jerusalem facing it again. The Lord often appeared to Paul with encouragement and guidance in important moments in his career. Paul had found this very unsupportive church in Jerusalem. He had suffered physically. He'd suffered emotionally before both the rulers and and these crowds of people. And he may have questioned, he may have regretted some of his actions. He needed the Lord's grace at this point. He needed something to come and comfort him, to to let him know that it's going to be okay. And that's what he receives. When we read this, these these words that Jesus speaks, they're specifically for Paul in this moment, but we can still find their reassuring application for our lives. That's what I love about Scripture. He's speaking directly to Paul. He's speaking to him, but it it translates to the lives of every believer. Jesus told Paul that he's got to go on. He's got to go to Rome and testify about him, just as he did in Jerusalem. Now, you know in Paul's mind, there's a couple things happening when, God, when Jesus says this. One, he's like, I know I'm going to survive this because he wants me in Rome. But two, what's going to happen in Rome? Am I going to face the same things? That was a reminder that Paul's task wasn't mainly to just defend himself, but it was to testify about Jesus. See, we too are commanded to testify to the gospel in front of many crowds, some unbelieving, some, some hostile, some unfriendly. Yet within all of this, what we see for Paul and what we see for ourselves is some encouragement here. There's four things, four parts of encouragement I want us to see when we know that Christ is always with us. And the first one is, is that he knows us. The Lord knows us. Jesus knew Paul's situation. He knew Paul's condition. And guess what? He knows what we face too. He knows who we are. We're never outside his gaze. Look at his own words. Look at Jesus' words in John chapter 10. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. How many of you are blown away by the fact that Jesus, the son of God, the savior of the world, knows us personally? I mean, honestly, the fact that we can call Jesus our savior, the fact that he's our brother, I mean, that the reality that, that he saved us, he knows us. That should just floor us every single day. He knows his sheep by name and he knows their needs. And some of us are needy, aren't we? (laughs) We are. But we don't have to cry them all out because he already knows them. The Lord knew Paul's condition. He knows ours as well. I mean, most of you come in and, and I don't see needy people. I see people that look like they got it all together. Their lives are good, right? Guess what? He knows the truth. He sees what's going on. But he doesn't just know us. He is with us. Jesus' presence comforted Paul. I'm sure Paul felt completely alone in this, right? He felt completely alone when he's facing this. But the reality was Jesus was with him. Jesus stood for Paul at the cross, and here he stands with Paul in the barracks. He says, be encouraged. The Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. Go back into to Hebrews. Look what we read there. It says, keep your life free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or abandon you. Do we realize that Jesus truly is all we need in this life? I mean, that, that, that sounds cliche. That sounds like, oh, yeah, yeah, well, whatever. No, it's true. He is the one that's going to be there forever. He's going to never leave us. He's never going to go away from us. And Paul needed this. He needed to be reminded that Christ was there. Not just with us, though. He's for us as well. I mean, this just keeps getting better. Paul needed this encouragement. And I don't know about you, but I do too. He says, I know you. I'm with you. I'm for you. I mean, it just keeps getting better. The Lord displays his support of Paul in in a couple ways. First, he gives him this exhortation. He says, have courage. 
Jesus exhorted Paul to endure courageously all the, the things that were flying at him from these opponents. He, he gives Paul the same exhortation over in, in, in Corinth. And we've got to remember this exhortation for ourselves as well. Jesus gives his followers this, this wonderful word of comfort and challenge back in the Gospel of John, going to chapter 16 of John. It says, I've told you these things so that you, that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. See, suffering is coming. Suffering is inevitable if we're going to follow him. That's just part of, of following Christ. He was persecuted. We're going to be as well. But he says, have courage. I've already defeated the world. I mean, what better news than, than the one we're going for, the one that's going with us, the one that's for us. He's already defeated it. We have victory in him. Y'all don't look very victorious. I mean, I mean, honestly, like I said, I, I can't imagine where Paul's at, the mental space he's in, and for Christ to show up and say, have courage. I'm with you. I'm here. I'm for you. Nothing's going to come again. You've got another journey ahead of you. Wow. Sometimes I need that. Jesus has conquered the world. The second thing the Lord gives uh, Paul is this commendation, Right? He says to Paul, he says, you've testified about me in Jerusalem. How many of you, when you get to heaven, how many of you want to hear Jesus look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant, right? We, all of us, we want to hear that when we get there. Paul gets to hear it right here, right? Paul says, or Jesus says to Paul, look, I told you to come here and talk about me and you did it. You've testified about me right here in Jerusalem. What encouragement to hear out of the mouth of Christ, hey, you did what you were told to do. You came and you told people about me. Charles Spurgeon, he said, Paul was too humble to console himself with this fact, right? He couldn't do it on his own, but, but here Jesus comes in and he gives him the ability to do so by acknowledging this brave deed that's happened. You ever feel like you've, you've, you've failed in your efforts to do things or they're, 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 they're just useless? I'm sure Paul was in that moment at, at, at the way that council ended, that meeting ended, right? And here Jesus is saying, no, you did what you were to do. You came and you spoke about me. Uh, Paul goes on, he asked, remember when he asked the Romans, if God is for us, who is against us, right? The, the great question to ask, but, but the answer is even better, Right? We can, we can press on in view of this reality. We, we see that the Lord isn't finished with Paul. He's not finished with us either. He, I keep telling you, if you've got breath in your lungs, he's got a purpose for you in his body. Never are we too old. Never are we too young to pursue what he's got for us. He's got a plan, and the church is, we, we're, we're that plan. It's time for us to get up and go. It's time for us to get busy, to take this seriously. Paul may have wondered if he was going to make it to Rome. But in telling Paul it was necessary that he testify there, the sovereign Lord let the apostle know that he was going to make it there. Because he knows that if God says, I'm going to get you there, he's going to get him there. Paul would encounter more trials and route. He would face everything that happened to him over the course of these next weeks, knowing that the Lord's purpose was going to prevail. Do we understand that, that, that God is going to come out the winner in the end? His purposes will prevail. So it's the only explanation that the church has lasted as long as it has. If this was a man-made thing, it would have fallen apart years ago. But because it's his plan, because it's his purpose, it's going to prevail. Jesus was not finished with Paul. The prospect of the future service must, must have been a great encouragement to this, this weary apostle. The psalmist said, the course of my life is in your power. While we still have breath, we should believe that Jesus has work for us to do. All of this, all of this is good news. We talked last week about accepting good news and how we should look and how we should sound and how we should be when good news is presented to us. That's what this is. The fact that, that he, is, he knows us and he's with us and he's for us and he's not finished with us kind of leads me to ask the question, how should we expect to experience these types of reassuring comforts of Jesus if we don't see a vision like Paul did? 
I can't imagine how wonderful it was for Paul to see, actually see Christ there beside him, telling him these things. But that's not really how it happens in this day and age, right? But let me remind you that the Lord still speaks to us by his spirit through the Christ-centered scriptures. Jesus meets us in his word. If, we will, if we'll marinate our thoughts and our hearts in the gospel, we will find great strength. So do not neglect the scriptures. The Pharisees, they had a, a category for resurrection, but they failed to rely on Jesus who himself was the resurrection and the life. Go study the scriptures. Allow it to, to lead you to back to Christ in everything that you read. That's a great lesson in and of itself, right? That alone can bring a ton of comfort, but we don't, we, 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 that's not the only lesson we learn in chapter 23. Now we're going to jump down and, and pick up in verse 20. Go back and read the rest of it. I don't want you missing any of it. But we see Paul being prepared to, to get away to Caesarea. Listen to what we read and starting in verse 20. Acts 23, the Jews, he said, have agreed to ask you to bring, down, bring Paul down to the Sanhedrin tomorrow as though they're going to hold a somewhat more careful inquiry about him. Don't let them persuade you because there are more than 40 of them lying in ambush, men who have bound themselves under a curse not to eat or drink until they have killed him. Now that they are ready and waiting, now they are ready and waiting for your consent. So the commander dismissed the young man and instructed him, don't tell anyone that you have informed me about this. When these men entered Caesarea and delivered letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. After he read it, he asked what province he was from. When he learned he was from Sicilia, uh, Sicilia he said, uh, I will give you a hearing whenever your accusers get here. He ordered that he be kept under guard in Herod's palace. So we see a jump. We see this, this person, this young man coming to tell them, here's the plan I've learned of. You need to be aware of this. Don't send Paul. Get him out of here. So they get him to, to Caesarea where, where they, they turn him over to the governor. And the governor says, okay, let's, let's put him in holding until the accusers get here and we can do this the right way. Now you go and you read through chapter 23 and you, and you see all these things that happen and it may seem kind of disconnected, disjointed. It may, it may seem like, like there's a lot of coincidence that happens. But guess what? If, as believers, we look at this and we should be able to see that God has his hand on this at all times. God is present through all this journey of getting Paul to where Paul's supposed to be. God has a plan for Paul, and he's going to achieve that plan as he sees fit. So even in this escape to Jerusalem, his journey to Caesarea, and, and really in our own lives as witnesses, we can see that God is in control. Paul had to feel like everything was out of his control at that point. He had to feel like the world was crashing down on him. But if he just pays attention, if he just looks around after Jesus' encounter with him, he's got to know that God is in charge of this. Paul finds himself in these stressful situations in, in these chapters. But in this passage, Paul is, the first, is, is first the object of this, this attack. He's a defendant in this tense court case that looks unwinnable. His chances of surviving these attacks of the angry Jews and the mighty Romans kind of looks like a, a butterfly against a steamroller. I mean, that's really what it looks like. There's, there's, there's just no hope for him. It doesn't look good. Yet the apostle remains calm and courageous. He submits to the sovereign plan and the power of God. What a lesson in just that. He doesn't say, well, watch me. Watch what I'm going to do. He says, I'm just going to rest in God. The passage shows us that we can rest the whole weight of our concerns on God, our Father, who holds the whole world in his hands. He's not, he's not taken his hand from the world. He, he's still involved. He's still here. He's still present. He's still doing things. Now, the names of God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they're not really mentioned in this part of, of chapter 23, but his fingerprints are everywhere in this story. It's kind of a notable absence, though. After having this encounter, we don't hear about him when, when this, this, this young man comes to talk and share the plan and they get, the, they get Paul out of here. It kind of, kind of harkens back to, to Esther. It reminds me of Esther. Because in that book, the name of God is missing as well. But again, we see him through it all, through every action and word and deed. In this passage, the same Lord who promised that Paul would get to Rome works through these people and these circumstances to accomplish his agenda. We sometimes can think God isn't working when we don't see visible signs of his sovereignty, 
but never mistake the lack of spectacular for the inactivity of God. Don't ever look around and go, well, he, he's left us. I mean, we can look at our world right now and we're like, where is God? Why is he allowed? He's still there. He still has a plan. He's still in charge. The day after Jesus reassures Paul in the barracks, you have these, these angry Jews hatching a plot to, to murder him. And, and they come to the, the chief priests and the elders and they share their plan and, and the Sanhedrin. Apparently, they're going to cooperate. They're going to agree and, and to act as if they're going to reconvene to discuss Paul's crime. The plan that, that they, they plan that as Paul approaches the meeting, they're going to jump him. They're going to assassinate him. They're going to execute him. He's done. I mean, so much for justice and, and the law with the Sanhedrin, Right? They were going to stop at nothing to achieve their selfish and religious goals. Such an evil plan was going to appeal to Ananias, the high priest, because he was known for violence. God, however, he says, nope, that's not my plan. That's not how it's going to go at all. And he brings this young man about it. This is an unnamed nephew of Paul. And he becomes an incredibly important advocate, one clearly raised up just for this. It's like we read in Esther. Go back to Esther. Like I said, this kind of reminds me of that. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place, but you and your father's family will be destroyed. Who knows? Perhaps you've come to your royal position for such a time as this. You ever heard that phrase, such a time as this? That's what we see here. It rings true in this passage. It's the only mention of Paul's family found in the New Testament. We, we get the impression from his writings that he lost connection with them after his conversion, but we learn here he's got a sister and we, he has a nephew. And we're not sure how, how the nephew comes to know of this plan other than God's sovereignty. God placed him where he needed to be to hear this plan so that he could alert those that he needed to talk with. We see God's sovereignty in all of this. See, the Lord can use little things or even unassuming people to accomplish His great purposes. The story illustrates the seamless integration between God's sovereign agenda and human decisions made by responsible people. The, the, the Lord already promised Paul that he was going to go to Rome. Paul knew he would get to Rome. I'm sure he was wondering how. But God was going to preserve Paul through the actions of these individuals. The nephew, the nephew hears of the conspiracy. He relates it. They act wisely. The Roman centurion does his job, and, and, and Lysias acts to protect Paul. There's no burning bush here. There, there, there's no light show. Paul, his life is spared because people do what's in front of them, what God has called them to do, and they respond, whether they realize it or not even. He's turned their hearts. He's changed their ways. God uses their actions to accomplish his purpose, to protect Paul. Lysias, he, he brings on the, the centurion to prepare infantrymen and, and, and mounted soldiers and spearmen. I mean, he's taken every precaution to get Paul safely uh, uh, over to Caesarea. We see God's rule over the affairs of people and the nations throughout Scripture. He turns the hearts of rulers and kings. Just as it's written in Proverbs 21, a king's heart is like channeled water in the Lord's hand. He directs it wherever he chooses. God is in charge. He is in control. They bring Paul to the governor, Felix, and, and, and they get him up to speed regarding the situation. Uh, he, he'd written this brief letter to him. And here again, we see how the Lord used him to protect, he used Lysias to protect Paul as he testified to Paul's innocence. This man wasn't a believer. This man just knew something wasn't right. And he pulls Paul, he pulls him to safety and he gets him out of town. The most important statement in that letter is the claim of Paul's innocence. Because the problem involving him, it revolved around theology. It didn't warrant death. It didn't warrant imprisonment. I including this, this note here, Luke kind of weaves this theme into Acts that, that Christians aren't dangerous lawbreakers. The application for us is simple. Christians should be honorable citizens. We, we shouldn't be ruthless pragmatists breaking laws for the sake of our cause and claiming we're acting in the name of God. When the laws of the land don't hinder us from living out our faith, then we should, we, we should abide by the rule of law as modern citizens. 
So these soldiers, they take Paul uh, to Antipartus the next morning by the cover of night. The, the horsemen ride onward with Paul to Caesarea. These guys, all they're thinking is we're moving a prisoner. We're following the, the, the rule of, of our commander. We're, we're moving this guy as a prisoner. To where, but guess what they're doing? They're transporting God's missionary and preacher to the next place that he's going to proclaim the good news. I mean, this is, they don't even understand what they're doing. They're like, this is my job. This is what I'm called to do. But, but the reality is God has used them in this way to get Paul safely where he's going to be so that he can proclaim the gospel yet again. Even this, this ruthless Felix, he was corrupt. He was incompetent, but he begins the right way. He, he promises to hear Paul's case as soon as the, the accusers get there from Jerusalem. He sends the apostle away to be held by Herod's guards. I mean, you've got to... I know someone looking in that's not a believer would be, well, that's just coincidence. No, that's God's plan in motion. That's God doing this. I mean, you have a nephew that, that, that hears the plan, that, that, that shoves it to the side and says, here, take care of him, make sure you save him. You see Lysias take the, the action that he needs to. You see these soldiers transport this prisoner. All of this occurs under the sovereign rule of King Jesus it's happening because God wants it to. One commentator said, sometimes God delivers his children by the simple word of a young relative. Sometimes he has to call in the cal cavalry. At all times, he is ultimately in charge. doesn't matter how he does it. God's going to do it. If that's his plan, it will, it will happen how he wants it to. God has an infinite number of options for working out his will in our lives. And while our, our daily lives may not look spectacular, we can be assured that God is involved in the affairs of his people. He's not a hands-off God. He is there at all times. Paul, Paul even says in Philippians chapter 1, I'm sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He didn't start this in us just so that it would just be there just so that we would just stay stagnant. He did it so he could bring it to completion. We need to trust him at all times, even in difficult circumstances. We need to thank him for his care and provision. Look, look and see his hand at work, even when it seems to be absent. You ever been there? You're like, where is God in this? Why is, why is this happening? Why is he silent? He's still there. What a wonderful reminder for us as God's witnesses ourselves. I mean, that's who we are. We are his witnesses just as Paul was. Jesus is always with us. God is always in control at all times. Who needed to hear that today? Who needed the comfort that comes about from, from hearing these truths? As we seek to be his witnesses, the likelihood that we're going to face what Paul faced is is. is highly unlikely. It's slim to none, really. Yeah, we may, we may face persecution and rejection or, or, or might be made fun of because of our beliefs, but, but beatings and near-death experiences and escapes, probably not. But we can still cling to these truths that we do not walk this path alone, that we know the one who's in charge at all times as we testify of God's love and salvation through Christ. I love, I love that we can look at Paul's journey and we can pull out the, the parts that encouraged him because he needed the encouragement, but so do we. I was at, we were at a wedding yesterday, and uh, I don't know, I, I, as, I, as I think about how we go about taking the gospel, sometimes I'm like, I, I know I don't do a good job of it. I know I need to be encouraged in it. But yesterday, we, we got through the wedding and uh, moved on to the reception. It was all at the same building. And, and so once our table got set, we went over and sat down. It was Tiff and I and our two oldest girls. And so we knew there were going to be people there. You kind of know how that is. You don't really know anybody at the wedding. You're like, oh, no, who's going to sit with us? And, and what's it going to be? Thankfully, the DJ was right behind us. so He couldn't hear anything <laughs> except him. And he was an excited DJ. He was really good. Anyway, this couple comes and sits down. And Ava kind of had to do the con conversing at first because we really couldn't hear anything. And so they started talking a little bit. 
And then the guy kind of pipes up and introduces himself and says how he knows the couple and asks how we know the couple. And we start talking, and, and he kind of starts <laughs> sharing. Well, it, I think it started because they, Ava told him that Ella studying interior design. He's like, well, we just opened a, an Airbnb, and, and I don't have anything on the walls, and, and she can't pick anything out by herself. She needs help, and why don't you come up and help? And he says, my, my purpose for this is I want it to be used for ministry. I want to see men come up here and stay and, and sharpen each other, and, and I, I just want to see... I was like, well, that's, that's an awesome purpose. I, I love your goal in that. And he goes, but, but here's kind of my story. And he starts to talk about his story. And uh, he, had, he, had, he was somewhat of a, a known name in hunting, and, and he had a little TV show and all this stuff. He, him and his wife, they were dating at one point. They broke up. He lost everything due to some poor decisions. And, and he said, you know, when I came to know Christ... I understood that Christ was it. Christ was all there was. That's all that mattered was I needed him. He goes, but the one thing I could not understand, the one thing I could not grasp was within all my interactions with all these people that I would talk with and that I would visit with, visit with none of them told me about Jesus. He said, why? It's, uh, he goes, I still am just baffled that no one, no one would tell me who he was. No one would, would show me who he was. And I thought, oh my gosh, why, 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 why do I find myself feeling that little nudge of, hey, you need to share the, the gospel, and I'll be like, well, someone else will do it. Maybe it'll be later. This, this guy was so upset that he hadn't learned earlier, that he didn't know sooner who this Jesus was. And I thought, well, if, if, if we're not doing our job like we should, that's a problem. If we're not sharing at every opportunity as Paul did, right? I mean, Paul got discouraged. He's, he's in a place of, of total discouragement, and he gets encouraged to go on to the next one. He's been beaten. He's getting ready to be killed. And he's still proclaiming the truth of the resurrection. Church. It's our turn. This is what he's called us to. This is what he saved us for. Be encouraged that when you go, you are not alone. Be encouraged that when you go, God is in control of this. This is the way he's chosen to do it is through us, his body. So as we prepare to, to respond today through song, I just want to encourage you. Maybe, maybe you just need to spend some time in prayer thanking God for these truths that bring encouragement, that bring comfort. Maybe you need to repent of times where you've not shared the gospel and you know you've been called to do it. Let's not put that off. Maybe, maybe you've not even responded to the gospel for yourself. That's where you begin. Begin that relationship with, with God through Christ who gave himself up willingly to bring us salvation, to redeem us, to put us back into right relationship with the Father. Accept that first, but then prepare to move. We're going to say the, the Great Commission again before we go today. Let's make sure that it's ringing true in our lives, that we're out there doing exactly what Paul did. But remember, he brings us comfort during those times. He can be our encouragement in those times. Be courageous. He's already defeated the world. Let's stand as the team comes and let's have a word of prayer before we respond through song today. Father God, once again, we thank you for the truth of who you are. We thank you for this story that, that reveals where Paul was and, and how you come to encourage him, how he, he can see the hand of God in, through his entire journey, Father. We, we look at it and we say, yeah, we know this. We know this. We, we have the head knowledge of this, but Father, help us to have the heart knowledge of it. Help us to know that when we go to share the good news, you're with us. Your spirit can guide us. You can give us the words, give us a boldness, give us this courage that we see in Paul. And Father, help us to never forget that our God is in control of all things. Sometimes we can, we can forget that. Sometimes we, we don't see it that way. But remind us, Father, that your will will be done. You've called us to be those going. So Father, help us to submit to you today. Help us to obey in our response to you. Father, create in us people who look more like your son 
And help us to be ready and prepared to go into this world to share the good news of who you are. We ask this all in Jesus' name.